For the past 18 years, Frank Nelson has worked for the Missouri Department of Conservation as a wetland ecologist, applying research to wetland management and restoration. He is interested in understanding how and where beavers can do their thing in Missouri without conflict and benefit our wetland and stream ecosystems. So join me in welcoming Frank to the stage. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity, and this has uh, been really uh, exciting and uh, ins insightful, and really made my head uh, spin a, a few times. So, um, appreciate the opportunity. Um, I've been working here with the uh, Missouri Department of Conservation, uh, and I'm, my co-authors Kyle Steele is a forest ecologist with uh, the Forest Service. Justin Thomas is a great botanist with Nature Site, and Doug Wallace is uh, also a forester with NRCS and recently retired. And so. Um, originally, my title was Relationships Between Beavers, Karst Fins, and the Legacy of Relic Species in Missouri, but through this week, I've come up with an alternate title of, really, this is a tale of recovery of, from ecological amnesia in Missouri. And so, I welcome you to uh, join me on, on this continuing uh, journey and wandering through the woods. And so, first off, we're going to kind of take you on a path of uh, the loss of Missouri wetlands and uh, landscape setting, as I understand them. And then also, we'll dive into exploring overlooked karst fins. And then finally, we'll end here with uh, reconstructing the past with beavers. And so first, we'll start here with the loss of Missouri wetlands. And so when we think about the Missouri, the Mississippi Flyway, the center of the continent, essentially, uh, Missouri has literally lost over 90% of, of their historic wetlands. And so that pinch point um, is literal for uh, the Mississippi Flyway. And looks like I've got my animations already moving. All right then, so, but wetlands are essentially, uh, in Missouri, the riverine systems are much different in terms of scale when we think about wetlands in, uh, say, the, the, the glacial north or the coastal plain. And so what that does in terms of the ease of draining our wetlands. And so these are relatively narrow strips of ground uh, that are flat and fertile, and multiple streams of income were able to be generated and therefore um, easily uh, basically altered. And we did that with overpowering our, our natural features with engineering. And so you have like the, the Mississippi looks like today, uh, wing dams, the navigation channels, power, agriculture, that's what shaped what we see today. Um, the removal of beaver was really the first point, uh, quite honestly, and we lost, and this is uh, the, where in Illinois too, we lost it in the late 1800s. Um, we did reintroduce beavers uh, in the 1920s, um, but there's been uh, heavy trapping ever since. And so we really don't know where we are uh, with beavers, but we, we know that we've uh, reduced habitat diversity, but that's something that's really not front and center when we think about alterations. Quite often, it's much more easier to think about the drainage that has occurred. Southeast Missouri, 1.2 million acres, had 6,000 miles of ditches, and those are the big ditches. And so that's a very tangible, visible alteration that we, we know we're dealing with. Altered river flows in terms of impoundments, um, uh, hydropower, we know we've altered the flows within our big rivers. And then the conversion of land and development. We, old growth forest, the loss of that in Missouri's, the same thing happens with our prairies. There's been a lot of development and, and land use changes over time. Also, um, the more roads and bigger and bigger levees over time. And so the amount of infrastructure on our floodplain systems are something we know we're, we're dealing with. And then also, it's not always inherent, but when you see green water, you know that there's an increase of, of, of nutrients as well. And so, quite honestly, we often focus on these lower um, alterations, and so I think we're just kind of uh, recovering from this ecological amnesia of what also, how did our stream systems look like historically? And that's not something that's been given a lot of discussion. So when I'm thinking about Missouri wetlands and classifying wetlands, we typically think of the hydrogeomorphic approach of the interaction of soils, landforms, and plants. And that's really helpful um, in terms of trying to put things in boxes, um, even though th there's always this variability and things that don't fit quite so well. And we have had less discussion in terms of how critters have influenced these habitats. Now, it's acknowledged that, yeah, sure, they followed disturbances, they created their own disturbances, and they helped with nutrient cycling and, and soil characteristics. But we often view the critters as living in wetlands as opposed to shaping the wetlands. <coughs> 
And so just taking, even stripping down the hydrogeomorphic approach a little bit to wetland, just think about the hydrology, um, you know, our fins, our seeps, and our springs are driven primarily by groundwater source. Our wet prairies and our sinkhole ponds and bogs elsewhere are driven more by precipitation. And then uh, when we think about our riverine systems, these are driven primarily by overland flow. And so uh, from a simple uh, aspect, we, we often focus um, on the, our big river systems because the state's quite varied, um, but there's these regional pockets where we're thinking about things differently. And riverine systems by, by and large uh, is what we're thinking about most times. But in the Ozarks, the southern half is where we have groundwater is very important in terms of what's driving our, our wetlands. However, most of our focus has really been on our large rivers, whether it's the Mississippi River, uh, the Missouri, the Grand, the Osage. And so in those, that larger scale, what we've done is engineered wetland impoundments, so a lot of concrete, steel, and water control structures, uh, where we have these uh, managed impoundments that we may disk to um, you know, stimulate the, the seed bank to have annual plants that will then uh, flood. And so essentially we're trying to mimic the conditions for a wildlife response and get thousands and thousands of birds. And eBird's been great. It's kind of like iBeaver in the fact of documenting all the critters. And like on our intensely managed areas, we, we've got 230 to 300 species of birds on these areas. And so it, it's, they're just phenomenal. And, um, but that's where our emphasis has been on these big river systems. In the last couple of years, um, to quote Tenacious D, I was hanging out with my good buddy Kyle, and uh, we thought we need to look at wetlands and, uh, and, and karst fins in the Ozarks. And these are just overlooked uh, little postage stamps that for the most part, it's like, well, we just need to protect these things. And so uh, this is in the, the this lower half, they're very small, oftentimes less than two acres, sometimes just the size of this podium, um, isolated uh, pockets that quite honestly, they were just wet spots for, for most of the people that you know moved in, the Scotch-Irish would move in. Uh, they knew there was groundwater discharge there um, and there are openings in the, in the forest, but uh, for the most part, just wet spots. In the 90s, the federally listed of the Heinz Ermel Dragonfly uh, really kind of made this uh, unique for um, the natural history biologists, as well as uh, there's some really unique flora and then some cool little bugs too that only exist there. But Kyle and I thought, well, hey, let's look at, uh, let's develop an ecological site description. Um, so and this is part of a national framework for classifying and describing rangeland and forest communities. It, it's a way to direct agency and partner funds and actions towards conserving a specific community. If you have an ecological site description, you can then apply for a RCCP and therefore direct funds towards these kinds of habitats. And it's similar to a hydrogeomorphic approach where you're looking at the landforms, the vegetation, the soil properties to describe this community. And we have uh, an ecological classification system across Missouri. So the whole thing in terms of uplands, lowlands. Uh, and so we had a good foundation to build off of because these are isolated and also inclusions in the soil uh, survey, they were overlooked. But we had some uh, other documents that we used to uh, kind of build off of and jump in deeper. And so these are also, I um, want to make clear too, these are saturated soils. They're not ponded water. It's just pretty mucky and, and, uh, and herbaceous for the most part. Some of them can be complexes of up to 25 acres. Um, so you're getting up to some, some scale. So we dove in first with a comprehensive literature review in terms of trying to compare karst fins with say fins further up uh, in the peatlands uh, in North America or even Europe. And then also um, we did field sites, uh, field work at 30 different locations um, doing botanical surveys as well as soil samples. And so karst fins have these glacial relics. There's 21 relic species, um, which basically they're just disjunct populations and um, really unique uh, fauna in flora. And so part of this is because, so if you think about the last glacial maxima, say the spruce community were in Missouri, but they've been moved up to Canada due to changes in, in the climate. And so, for example, like the marsh bell flower, you'll see uh, the little yellow dots in, in the Ozarks and then also uh, in the Ap lower Appalachia. These are really rare, but you go further north and they're found uh, more, more commonly. 
And then there's also these other uh, unique species in these unique places as well that are of species of, of greatest conservation need. And you'll see for the most part, they're just small stuff that are easily overlooked. Um, and so when people were looking for the hind dermal dragonfly, uh, there was these perceptions that beavers could be posing a threat to these relic species, uh, to the burrowing crayfish, uh, and ultimately threatening the hind dermal dragonfly because of the ponding conditions and the shift in vegetation that beavers can uh, you know, uh, manage in, in these locations. So we were kind of fighting this perception already, and so we just wanted to kind of understand where these locations were. And quite honestly, it's like, well, this is really geologically controlled. Water, geologic fracturing, and time has, has really kept these fins uh, with 83% of them within these four geologic units. And part of this is because of this leaky lithology. We have these beautiful springs like Greer Springs, high magnitude discharge and uh, basically water's going all over the place. But um, uh, these fins are kind of where water's just seeping out and, it, and it's very diffuse. But it's because of this underlying geology and interaction of, of rock and water. And so uh, what we found was actually our fins are actually in these higher order streams, 89% of them, uh, zero to three order streams. And it's typically where our losing streams turned more into gaining streams. And I know there's some eagle-eyed uh, Beaver biologists out here going, oh, there's the Venn diagram. He's getting the beavers. Pump your brakes. I'm, I'm, I'll get there. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, basically, we've got this uh, impermeable layer in which water's poking out of the ground, typically at the toe slope, and it's saturating the uh, soils and then moving on um, into our adjacent streams. So we started digging into these soils because really this is cool stuff because we don't have organic soils in Missouri. We go wet to dry all the time, so everything decomposes. But in these locations, outside of a few uh, archaic lake beds, this is where we have histic soils, or almost histic soils, depending upon the depth. And that's because of this permanent saturation and reduced decomposition, and this, therefore this peat buildup. And it's, it can be variable depending upon the site, but it's this permanent water table that's creating these conditions. We have some variable textures. Some is, could be technically organic, others mucky mineral. And it's variable depth. And we we're kind of thinking maybe something with the slope or uh, landscape position or versus a terrace versus a floodplain. But then we also noticed this beaver activity. And it was like, well, maybe that's also affecting the soil development here. Perhaps these locations that lower in the, in the floodplain, uh, it's, it's a shorter process in which, you know, the sediments are being captured. Or maybe it's also the plant growth that's also helping form the, the, uh, the peat. And, and so contributing to a longer process. Really just got more questions about these soils. Also, one thing we were noticing too is it, it really these areas contribute to the biodiversity. Each fin looks a little bit different. Um, so in terms of alpha diversity, uh, it really varies depending upon the site. Some may have 106 species, some may have 20, but they're really diverse and, and, and unique. They all t have a little bit different flavor. And they also contribute to the beta diversity because they're surrounded by forest. And so these wetland species, as well as these disjunct or relic species, really add to that diversity uh, of the region itself. And then you had these e examples also where beaver have impacted. And so you've got a whole different wetland community uh, within those locations as well. And so we had seen in the literature that Man, you know, this isn't new. You know, fins and beavers, they, they're, there's something going on here. We found, you know, up in Michigan and in the Western Rockies, um, also in Georgia and Tennessee and Alabama, Nature Serve has some communities that talked about, you know, in fins, you've got some of this weedier, um, nutrient-loving species in those locations. And, you know, it's like, well, yeah, beavers have been keeping this open, we think, over the years, it's, but fairly general associations. So there's still more questions. What's going on here? And so looking at the ecological dynamics, thinking about close to that groundwater discharge to say the outer, outer perimeter of the fin itself, thinking what's going on chemically. Uh, with the soil saturation, you have the anoxic conditions, more oxygen when things are drying out. Nutrient stress, that, that flow is pushing the nutrients away. Uh, there's probably also some zinc or calcium toxicity uh, due to the, the, uh, the, the ge geology itself. And as you get further away, that's, that's mitigated a bit. And so these are really tough conditions to grow in, and that's why we were seeing these short statured, slow growing, uh, diverse species where they're just surviving, they're not thriving. 
Whereas when you got kind of closer to the edge, to the woods and everything, you got these taller, fast growing species because of this nutrient availability. And also the same thing with in terms of peat buildup, that saturation is kind of in here with the chemical, the uh, composition and, and interactions. And so really this nutrient cycling is going on on the, on the uh, periphery. And then also thinking about fire and I was kind of what Emily has talked about earlier in terms of uh, that soil saturation, really um, we see some of these areas probably didn't have a high fire frequency in the heart of these fins. Um, because this, the heat impact, that, all that soil column itself was a, a heat buffer. And so, um, but on the, the perimeter, you have a little bit where things are burning up. There could be more decomposition, more nutrient cycling, that sort of thing. And then comes the beaver. Like, well, what's going on here? We know that they, they do things, but what is it that they do? They're shifting the nutrient dynamics. And so, um, with the ponding, you have the increased potential for silt and organic matter, water table fluctuation seasonally, where um, it may have been more mitigated uh, just within the soil substrate itself, and therefore more nutrients that are available. And so with that, we see a, wholly, uh, a totally different, more generally emergent wetland plants in a totally different state. And so there was concern, I guess, in terms of the dynamics that you know beavers can shift uh, what's going on chemically and therefore impacting some of these plants. And so uh, within an ecological uh, site description, you have these different community phases. And we developed uh, three. The first two is this open uh, fin stage, which has these sedges and forbs. We also have a closed fin stage where you've got the canopy. These sites are so small that the canopy is enclosed and you've got a little bit different mix of, of plants. But what to do with these, uh, these beaver complex and, and influence sites? Well, we said, you know, this is definitely something that was out there. And so we developed a, a marsh fin phase. And so these are our reference states. And we have a lot of other sites as well. And some of these are impacted. Some of these are degraded and also agriculturally dominated. But the reason why we lay this out is then we can figure out the pathways to kind of bump these communities up and possibly restore them. We may not always get back to the reference state, but we can at least try to, to do the right thing and uh, improve some of the, the resiliency of, of some of these locations. And so that kind of gets me to this, a little bit further down the path in terms of reconstructing the past and how do beavers really fit in this thing? And so essentially we have a temporal scale. The couple of pond is a, a carcinical pond where we have pollen records dating back 10,000, 16,000 years ago. And so we know that these plants, these relic species were established back in the late glacial maxima and we thought, well, maybe these sites are old too. So we dug into the soil and we did some radiocarbon dating and uh, to see, you know, how old are these soils? And we were kind of surprised, like the oldest was actually only 6,000 years old, um, with a lot of it being, you know, a thousand years or less. And it's like, Man, these things are a lot younger than we thought. Well, when we start thinking about the climate record and everything, things have been getting warmer uh, up to the last 6,000 years, the hypsothermal. And that's when we saw tall grass prairie really expand in the Ozarks. And so really you kind of got, we, we can't expect to have more organic soils that are older than that because everything would have dried out and so, um, and burnt up essentially. Also car systems are very dynamic as well. You got water going every which way. Um, and so things could dry out, they could also get wetter. And then uh, with warming temperatures, increased rainfall, we've got all these other trees, the forested woodlands, and so that's how we have this mix because of this climate shifting over time is how we've got this mix of relic species, tall grass prairie species within this uh, larger upland um, forested matrix. And then also with climate change, we're thinking, we, we're seeing woody en encroachment in some of these things. And that could be due to the increased CO2 and temperatures, longer growing seasons, all facilitating the growth of more trees. And so that still raises the question, man, how, how do we get past this, this uh, 6,000 year gap here um, that relic species have persisted in these isolated locations? So I started looking at um, the, um, the landscape itself. So the beach groundwater discharge in a couple different spots, dotted in different places on the, on the landscape. Some locations have activity with beaver, some don't. And many of these are still unmapped. In terms of alterations, there was stream channelization, of course, that would have happened with the reduction of beaver as well as big machines. 
There's been ditching in, in places, and some of these have been impounded for fishing or livestock ponds. So this, and then, of course, we've got roads that are coming across and pump houses and that sort of thing. And grazing and off-road uh, disturbance jacking things up even further. But thinking about the ecological dynamics, beaver activity, we, we, we start putting some wood back out there. What would that have happened? It would have increased our water tables. It would have uh, increased anabranching channels, which then uh, would have also increased your spatial heterogeneity. And suddenly we start seeing there's greater opportunity for fins and perhaps the associated plants that may have been more common historically than we see today. And we see some of this evidence out on the landscape. When we were out there, some of these uh, little stream sides, we were noticing that there's fin-like plants in these little small pockets. We call them fin finlets for not having a better term. Or even the middle of the channel itself hanging onto a clump of moss. It's like, that's a fin plant. What's it doing in this stream? And, and then also the presence of beaver. We're seeing some of abandoned beaver dams uh, that are grass covered and, um, and buried wood in the soil profile. And there's opportunity to do more research in terms of ground pen penetrating radar and additional radiocarbon dating. And we're just kind of, you know, scratching the surface. Dr. Wool's papers uh, really kind of made things click for me. Um, there's, in terms of beaver complexes and fins today, the increasing of water table and diversity of habitats, there's this place called Hodge Hollow that we're really seeing this horizontal and lateral uh, connectivity of, of beaver complex habitats. And when we think about scaling this up to the watershed, we've got a couple isolated beads and, and pearls on a string essentially, but thinking historically, man, that could have been really dynamic uh, with a lot more of this heterogeneity and therefore this greater connectivity of metapopulations of these relic species to exist. Um, and so just really thinking about it, despite the changes of climate over thousands of years, the beavers and springs and streams really could have maintained these relic species by providing greater distribution of niches that really, we weren't thinking about this two years ago. And so the current landscape really reflects the changes in the last 200 years, um, isolating what we now know as these isolated fins and associated plant species. And so instead of a perceived threat, I've kind of come full circle and I've been thinking really these are inherent allies for uh, the long-term biodiversity. And, you know, when you've lost 90% of historic wetlands, you know, trying to imagine what was, you really have to overcome this ecological amnesia, which uh, there's a long, long way to go. And so kind of acknowledging some of these uh, fauna and flora associations are likely missed, overlooked, and undervalued, especially these small little spots like this and, and the interactions of beavers. And so this, I think this raises not only questions for the Missouri Ozarks, but also some additional karst uh, springs and, and, and uh, groundwater wetlands elsewhere um, along the Appalachians and in terms of the central interior seepage fin, southern ridge and valley seepage fins. And anyway, this project has been really a great way to kind of fill in some gaps. It's relied on existing frameworks and partnerships and benefited from cross-disciplinary input and communication and uncovered some nuances and benefits of beaver that we hadn't been thinking about. And so now we are actually evaluating some opportunities to incorporate beavers in their habitats as restoration tools in upland drainage ways. And I've got an established hypothesis, I believe, that uh, could be vetted further uh, with further research and, and inquiry. So um, I'm, I'm hoping some folks will be really interested in, in pursuing that further. So anyway, that's my tale of recovery from ecological amnesia in Missouri. And I hope you enjoyed the trip. <laughs>